Welcome to the Great Traits Project podcast. We investigate the character traits that drive great achievements and reveal the mindset behind success. Throughout these podcasts, we introduce you to remarkable individuals from the world of sport, business, the military, the arts, science and technology, groundbreaking explorers, and many more. We shed light on how they behave and what they believe, and we discuss their attitude to life. On the 3rd of November 2016, we'll release our book, which is called Great Traits. The book reveals the five character traits that make successful people tick, and it can be found on Amazon by searching for Great Traits, which is spelled G-R-E-A-T, then Traits, T-R-A-I-T-S, or search for the author's name, Tobias Harwood, which is spelled T-O-B-I-A-S, and then Harwood, spelled H-A-R-W-O-O-D. All the author's proceeds from the sale of the book are donated to the charity Walking with the Wounded. The reason why is explained in the first chapter of the book. On this month's podcast, we meet Jamie McDonald's. Jamie is a fundraising adventurer who has cycled from Bangkok to his hometown of Gloucester in England, a journey of over 12,000 miles. Soon after that mammoth journey, he took on the static cycling world record, which he smashed by 44 hours, setting a new record of 268 hours, or more than 11 days, on the static bike. In 2014, Jamie completed a solo run of 5,000 miles across Canada, which raised over £250,000 for sick children. Every podcast begins with the guests summarising their most significant life events in less than two minutes. And with that, I give you Jamie McDonald. Hi, uh, my name is Jamie McDonald. Um, I'm an adventurer, a motivational speaker, a bit of a fundraiser. Um, and a bit of a like part time idiot, really. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, about five years ago, I ended up um, kind of not buying or not buying a house. And then I bought a bike and cycled from Bangkok to Gloucester, uh, 14,000 miles. And then I broke the world record on a static bike. And then also ran across Canada 5,000 miles, um, raising money for children's hospitals across the world and the ones that helped me as a kid. Um, until I raised a quarter of a million pounds, uh, which is bonkers because I I just never dreamed of that. Really, I had like a 10 grand target. Um, And now I've set up a charity of my own called Superhero Foundation just to, I guess I've accidentally learned how to fundraise, so I'm, I'm kind of passing that knowledge on. Brilliant. There's obviously an array of amazing things to talk about there. Let's kick off, Jamie, and talk about what is Shringomyelia and what did you experience as a, as a young boy? This is a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it, yeah. really, Toby? <laughs> Shringomyelia, I, I can't even spell it still now, um, is a really rare condition. Um, and basically there's only, you know, a kind of few hundred people in the UK that actually have the condition. There may be more, but people probably wouldn't know they have it. And it's a neurological um, problem where, you know, anything can happen between... You know, having numbness in your hands. Uh, sometimes you can't move the legs. Uh, sometimes I had epilepsy fits. Like literally, it's so kind of um, yeah. It could just be any symptom at all. So um, that's kind of what it is, really. So it's a pretty tough start in life. And so, um, can you sort of just touch on that? was something which kind of seemed to pass when you reached a certain age or something that you managed to overcome. And then you went on to become a tennis teacher, is that right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess as a kid, I was really, really sick with Shringomyelia and, and maybe other problems too. But um, I got to about uh, seven years old and the, the doctor took me and my mum into a room and he kind of just said to us, he's like, I'm, I'm really sorry, but your your boy's very likely going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life um, or or potentially even worse. And so we kind of walked out and my mum was like, you know what, James, was like, don't you dare listen to a word that doctor has just told you, don't you dare. And then at nine years old, we we went out to the back garden. My mum put this piece of string in the back garden. She said, come on, Jay, let's come play tennis. And, and like, you know, I was thinking, oh, I don't really feel like playing, you know. Um, and I went out there and I cracked the ball for the first time. And I just got that love for movement. Um, I was like a dog, you know, if you throw a ball, they just run. That was, that was me at that age. And when I, after about a year, 
like the the symptoms just gradually disappeared um and i guess you know it become like a, a bit of a miracle really that you know most people with shrunk miley it, it normally gets worse and and you become disabled but it just seemed to disappear for me and then you know when i got to like 16 years old and i had like my massive vision to be like you know roger federer um, but i kind of realized toby i was just really really bad at tennis um so yeah i became a teacher great stuff so uh, around this time i think you saw your friends probably head off down the road of what might be conceived as a conventional career path right they got vaguely conventional jobs but um it wasn't long before you decided the conventional path wasn't for you yeah you know i once i saved up to put twenty thousand pounds on a house like i worked my socks off for three years and then at the last minute i got that gut feeling in your stomach when you you kind of know something's wrong but you don't quite know what it is and and after a few days on reflection i suddenly realized that the only reason why i was getting the house is because everyone else around me was buying one so i i kind of reflected that what is it that i want out of life you know i kept posing that question to myself and it's one that we don't do often enough and so then i i, I kind of just yeah I, I suddenly realized that actually i might be in a position to give back to the children's hospital that helped me because if it wasn't for them i you know i probably wouldn't be here today so i i went in and i had a look at what they'd done in gloucester and then i walked out and then i bought a terrible old bike for 50 quid out of the newspaper and then I, you know, I got in touch and said, right, I'm, I'm going to cycle from Bangkok to Gloucester for you. Unbelievable. So how, just to remind us, how many miles is that? Uh, 14,000 miles. And roughly how long did that take? Uh, it took 10 months of cycling. So let's, let's go to like day one. You land in Bangkok, you get the bike off the plane, you, you start cycling. And what, what goes through your mind at that point? Was I, I never really tried out the bike. So I just like it landed in and then I assembled it and then I just got going. I didn't have a map, but all I had was a compass that pointed in the, the other direction into uh, Cambodia. So I just got the compass and realized I need to take that road. So I just gunned it. And I was so excited, Toby. I was just like, Saudi cab, you know, Saudi cab to every single person that I met. So that's Thai for uh, Hi, hello. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah if my yeah. memory's right, I think so. And then after, you know, a few hours of cycling, this little nut came off the bike. And then I kind of started to think, oh, my God, I, what am I going to... I can't fix this bike. I don't know nothing about cycling. And then my whole world just come crashing down and I ended up locking myself in a hotel room. Uh, and then I started puking on the toilet. And I was like, what am I going to do? I can't do this. I've told all my mates at home I'm going to cycle this. And then I went to bed that night and in the morning I just kind of woke up. I was like, come on, Jamie, you know, just just man up, you know, just get out there and do one day of cycling. Uh, so I went out there and I'd done, you know, one day and and it worked out. And then the next day I went again and then the weeks and the months just started to unfold, really. It's amazing. It's it's quite remarkable that you didn't take a map. It's just incredible. <laughs> I did pick up one on the way, though, eventually, yeah. <laughs> so... um so that that obviously was ad adventure number one. After ten months, you get home, and um, even though you've done ten months of cycling, you uh, you quite quickly decide that you want to take on the world record for static cycling. So um, just talk talks through. You get home, and there's a gap of what two days between when you return having cycled 14,000 miles and then taking on the challenge. Yeah, you know, I, on the way home, I kind of had this idea. I wondered what the longest ever bike ride was and I Googled it when I was in Iran. Um, and I'm pedaling through and I go out and this Italian guy comes up and this world record, he sat on a static bike for 10 days non-stop. And I just thought, what? That is completely impossible. Anyway, and then I just shoved it to kind of one side of my brain and thought, that's, you know, ridiculous. And then as I kept pedaling back to Gloucester, I kept thinking, well, actually, that might be possible. And then as the weeks went on again, I kind of thought, well, if it is possible, then maybe I should have a go. And then I suddenly realized that if I was going to have a go, 
I might actually fail and that acceptance of failure actually made me go on the internet and then I, I booked the Guinness World Record and then I, I, I kind of cycled into Gloucester and then I just thought I'd strike while the iron's hot while my legs are strong you know and I'm mentally strong and then I ended up getting on the bike and I just got pedaling you know like just it was non-stop uh, there were rules though so every yeah Every hour you cycle, you you get basically accumulate a five minute break, and so four hours of cycling, you've got a twenty minute break. Um, and there was one person at that time that said, uh, "Right, how would you feel if you cycle for twenty four hours and then you can accumulate a two hour break? And within that period, you should be able to get a one and a half hour sleep cycle." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm game. Let's do it." Um, the only trouble, though, you had to you had to pedal above uh, twelve miles an hour or twenty kilometers an hour every single hour, and if it dropped once, it was the end of the record. Wow. That's incredible. So do you, do you want to talk about saddle sore or should we leave that out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we can definitely get in there on the saddle sore. It makes me feel better actually talking about the saddle sore because it was so bad. It's therapeutic for me. Uh, it, it, the saddle sores actually happened on day eight. So like I started properly crying. So we like proper man tears. And, uh, and, and I was crying so bad and they, they actually like realized that my bum was getting so bad it was becoming infected. So then they were like, right, you know, we need to get some skin specialists in because if it becomes infected, I'll get sick and then it will the end the record. So they, these nurses come in and they come in and then they take a photo of my bum. Um, and then they, and then they, they showed me like, why would you do that? You know, and then they and, and then they just said, we're really sorry, Jamie, but there's nothing we can do for your bum to heal. You need to get off that bike. And I, all I remember thinking is like, you know, thank you very much. You know, and then they they walked off, and I just at that moment it was like, you know, I've just got a few days left, so I just just dug deep and just started pedaling. Uh, but this one guy, uh, Jamie, came up and said, uh, he said, I think I've got it. I know what's going to heal your bum. You've ever heard of Manuka honey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, Manuka honey ended up being like the the saviour, really, like the antibiotic. So yeah, slapped honey on my bum, um, and it and it healed it up. Yeah, that's a top tip for anyone <laughs> out there. <laughs> so to 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 conclude on the static cycle, you smashed the old record by forty four hours. I think is that right? Yeah, it ended up going on for yeah a couple of days. Like once I broke the record, I, I I'm not going to lie, you know, I thought I've done it by one hour, so I just get off. Um, but then I just thought, actually, let's just keep going. Let's, how far can I go? And then I went for two days, and then literally all the volunteers that were helping were like, Jamie, we're really sorry, you know, in a few days' time, it's Christmas. We need to get Christmas presents for our family, and you know, and 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 to be fair, I was completely psychotic at that stage, and so I was not making any sense. So it was the right decision to get off. That is amazing. So. Um let's uh let's talk about the the big one let's talk about canada and uh let's just highlight the kind of key stats there so that was a five thousand mile run and uh and how long did it take i took it nearly a year of running in the end yeah it's incredible so roughly you're doing about a marathon a day roughly give or take and um can you can you talk us through a kind of average day? What's the routine like? <laughs> the average day is literally so you you know I ended up um, putting my hand in the Atlantic Ocean in Newfoundland, and when I got running, it was a little bit like Forrest Gump, Toby, like because I just didn't know what I was doing, so I never knew what the average day was going to be like. Like so, I I just got running to start with, um, and. I, and, and, you know, I'd run, you know, a half a marathon in the morning and kind of just, you know, get it out of the way. And then I'd have my tin fish and my butter um, and, and, you know, have a bit of a snooze, bit of a stretch, bit of strength training. And then, I, you know, it's ridiculous because I had to do the strength training as well as the, you know, the, the marathons because I knew that kind of it was injury pre- prevention. So then I'd, and then I'd do another half marathon in the afternoon. And then afterwards, then I'd look at trying to get... Um, like a spot in a in a ditch with my tent or or potentially uh somewhere to stay so um 
to give people some context on this, you let's talk through the amount of planning you did before you went. <laughs> uh, well, I just, I just, you know, when I finished the bike ride, the the, the static cycle, everyone around me was like, you know, what are you doing next? What are you doing next? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing next? I'm like, I've, you know, I've done enough already, and uh, but it did just feel right. And at that point, it they built a new school playroom at the hospital. And so I just thought, right, well, maybe I do need to keep going. I had a Canadian visa. So I, I then just, yeah, I, 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 my visa was running out. Right? So I, I didn't have time to train. So some guy came up to me. He's like, are you going to do some running before Canada? And I was thinking, do you know what? 5,000 miles is enough. Like, I don't think I want to add to that. Uh, so a few weeks later, I just, yeah, without having any kind of, any plan or any training done i just flew out there and how can you ever prove that you're fit to run five thousand miles that's so true like at what point like at what point in your training schedule you're like yeah i'm ready to do it i'm ready to run across canada (laughs) so let's let's highlight to people what you're you're trying to take with you okay so you're setting off from the atlantic ocean you've got five thousand miles ahead of you along the way you're carrying your tent, your supplies for the kind of short term. You're also carrying a laptop and trying to maintain social media as well. And you're carrying all your kind of clothes, protective equipment. Um, and um, I know that quite soon on that put, a, a, unsurprisingly, that put a real strain on, on, on your body. Yeah, so I started out with a backpack. Like everyone said, well, how are you going to do it? It's like, well, of course it's going to be with a backpack. Like, how else are you going to do it? And so I ran with that. And after about two weeks of running it, the backpack weighed 30 kilograms and I weighed 60. So it was half my body weight. And I guess I was almost pretty much obese running across. And then eventually my foot just kind of gave in and it just I just felt a crack. And so I thought I'd broken my foot. So I, I hobbled into a town. And luckily there were two people uh, that spotted me and took me into their homes. And luckily they were runners and they knew what I was doing. And then I, I went and got a bone scan. And as it turned out, I, I didn't have a fracture. Uh, I just had ligament damage. So I took I took a few weeks off. And, you know, there was only like, I don't know, 195 marathons to go. <laughs> so... <laughs> So luckily it healed and then I, you know, I just carried on running on that. But what we've done in that moment is changed to a pram. And that was the key, really. Suddenly all the weight was unloaded off my shoulders and into the pram. So I had my tent, my sleeping bag. And like you say, you know, my, my laptop. And then, I, and then I just pushed that along. And that was called Caesar? Caesar. <laughs> Great name. So... Um... When you kick off, you've got 5,000 miles ahead of you. How do you, in your head, how do you not become overwhelmed by that? How do you break that down? I, I don't think I um, like pre-planned that, really. I don't think I thought that through on, on how it's going to be. Or I'm very naive, so I, I, I never really look ahead. And then, you know, you, you might have these, like, flashes of like you know then running in like minus 40 in the canadian winter and then i'll have a bit of a panic attack and then just realize that actually what's going on now like what's happening right now in my life and then i'd look down you know i'd be taking one step and then two steps and i'll look at my prowl look at caesar you know and then a car would come past i'd give him a little wave and so really just trying to kind of be in the moment and I think what's what's amazing is the array of places that you slept. So um, let's let's highlight some of the least glamorous spots you had to uh, you had to sleep in. Um, well, I get like I mean I, I was sleeping in a tent, you know, in in ditches, just yeah. And and at the beginning it was you know hardcore winter. So it was, it was pretty brutal, but I, I quickly realized, you know, again, being in the moment, I just realized I was quite, I was quite, felt quite lonely within a month of running. And so I just thought, I I need some people. So one of the first houses I went up to and I just knocked on the door and I was like, hi, I'm, I'm running across Canada. I was like, is there any chance I can camp on your lawn? But in my head, I was just thinking, 
please let me in. And this woman was like, no, you can't, you know, like, off you go. And I was like, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, I don't, I don't want to upset anyone. So I started walking off. And then she said, well, who are you anyway? And I was like, well, I'm running. And she said, wait there, will you, boy? And I was like, okay, you know, and then she went off and she come back five minutes later and she's like, I've just Googled you and you're real. And then literally she came back out five minutes later again. And, and you know, she said, right, you know, stop setting up your tent. You know, you don't need to worry about sleeping out here. She said, there's a motel just over the road. Um, I've just I've just gone and called them up. It's all paid for. There's a key waiting for you. Um, knock yourself out. Amazing. The kindness of strangers. Along the way, can you just touch on how often do you think, am I going to make this? Am I not going to make this? Am I going to fail? Can, can you sort of share with us what are the kind of undulations like in terms of your, um, in terms of your conviction that you're going to get to, to the Pacific Ocean? It's a roller coaster and it can change from one minute to the next. It can change from one hour to the next or one day to the next. You know, and you, you never really know what you're going to get, you know. So um, I, like very early on, I got a bit of a niggle in my foot. You know, like, oh no, like I can't run that because it's going to get worse. Oh my God, if it gets worse and my whole foot's going to be broken. Oh my God, how am I going to run? And then you'd spiral off into this, oh my God, this is the end. This is the end. And it started with a tiny little bit of pain in your foot, you know, and, and suddenly, you know, it's the worst thing ever. And you somehow got to just like, you know, just draw yourself back in. Okay, it's okay. And then off you go again. Along the way as well, can can you just talk about when when the pain kicks in? Obviously, you're you're running roughly a marathon a day. You're trying to run five thousand miles. Pain is guaranteed. Just can you sort of can you touch on like how do you deal with that and how do you prevent yourself or how do you re- recover uh, psychologically from when the pain kicks in? It's a really good question, actually, Doris. So about it's about 140 marathons in, and that's when my my foot really just started to give way. Like it, or well, it was giving way before that, but it really started to go. And and then I, I had it checked out, and I picked up chronic tendonitis, and so there was no way of of st- I would have needed to stop for six months to then continue on, you know, it, pain free. So then I had to make that decision. You know, do I? Do I just give up now and do I, you know, pack it in or do I just keep running on the pain? And so I like I had one one night um well I just I just woke up in the morning and I was like I just I just can't do this. My foot was just ballooned out and I I was like oh I just I, I'm done. And I was like do you know what? I, same again, you know, like 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 back in Bangkok, just go out there and do one day, you know. And so then I I went to get my foot into the shoe but my foot was so swollen I couldn't fit it in. So then I was like, right, well, how am I going to do this? Then I went and got a pair of scissors and then I cut into the trainer. And then I got my, my foot into the trainer, but it was all floppy. And and so then it was, you know, I couldn't run with it. And I was like, right, well, I'll get some duct tape. So then I, I got some duct tape and I duct taped the shoe together on my foot. And then I just went out there and I just every single step, you know, just just seeked seeked enjoyment in in the pain you know really really embrace the pain that's amazing talking about taking on pain as if 5000 miles wasn't long enough you took a massive detour along the way can you talk us through why you took the detour um so when i hit i think it was uh oh my memory is terrible like how can i forget oh ottawa i was in ottawa and i'm at this i'm at this point where it's like crossroads it was a literal crossroads wasn't it yeah it was a crossroads and it i could either go like a shorter route across canada um to your right and then or to your my left was an extra 15 marathons you know on top of the journey and really with my visa running out and the canadian winter those extra 15 marathons could could you know in a 
maybe I wouldn't make it. Um, but the reason why I wanted to do the extra miles was that there was a children's hospital um, that I was raising money for um, called Sick Kids. So I, in the end, I ended up running and uh, I'd done the 15 marathons. And I had all these amazing experiences along the way. And when I got there, um, it raised about £15,000 for the hospital. And all the doctors and nurses came out and the kids dressed up as superheroes. And I was wearing the Flash outfit then, um, the superhero of the Flash, because I needed to get there, you know, obviously a lot more faster. Uh, and and it, I just, it was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. Um, and, and then the doctor came over and he was like... He, he shook my hand and he was like, wow, Jamie, you know, like going the extra mile really does make the difference. You know, and I felt really chuffed, Toby. I was like, you know, I was feeling all fuzzy and feeling in that belly. And I was like, but I couldn't let it go. Like I, I couldn't let it go. I was like, I was like, cheers, doc. I was like, oh, you know, thank you. Thank you. I was like, but you need to know that was not an extra mile. That was an extra 15 marathons. And the flash outfit kind of inspired you and almost like reignited you in a way. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Do you know what? The flash outfit did ignite me. I, we put a, a competition on Facebook as four costumes, Batman, uh, the flash, Super Mario, who I really wanted to be because I love Super Mario and then Supergirl. And, you know, people would do their vote and then they make a donation towards the hospital. And, and then I was, I was like, actually, do you know what? they're clearly going to pick like super girl. Like I'm going to be dressed as a girl for, for 15 marathons. And then, you know, in the end, like they went for the flash and one of the schools that I ended up kind of running in at the, at the end of these miles, I, I, I ran in and all the teachers were dressed up as superheroes. And then there was over 300 kids dressed up as superheroes. And I just suddenly thought, Actually, do you know what? This is really relating to the younger generation. They're loving it. Like, why should I take this off? This is, you know, this is great fun. So let's just touch on another huge obstacle you had to overcome, which is crossing the Rockies in winter. Can you just talk us through what the park rangers said to you when you tried to embark upon crossing the Rockies? Yeah, it's a really good point because, you know, with my chronic tendonitis and, you know, there was, you know, 30, 40 marathons to go and suddenly I was entering the Rocky Mountains and as supportive as, as, supportive as the Canadians were, they kind of started to turn on me a little bit because the rangers and the police and the public, they were just like, don't go, Jamie, you know, no one's ever crossed the Rocky Mountains um, in the winter, you know, you're going to die and you're, and you're also putting other people in danger because there's no hard shoulders in the Rockies, you know, because it's all full up with snow and there's big blind corners. And I, I kind of thought, do you know and what? huge they, trucks, and, I remember. Yeah, you know, like huge trucks just bellowing around. And so all, all the, everyone's passing on their fears. Literally, it felt like the whole country was telling me to go home, but I just felt like I was so close and so I battled between it all. And then I, I received one message, really, that kind of changed everything. And the message went something like, um, Hey, Jamie, um, I'm not sure if you can remember me and my boy Samuel. We met you halfway across Canada. Um, I just want you to know that um, Sammy's cancer now has returned and he's out of treatment options. Um, and she's like, you know, as a mum, obviously, I'm just completely and utterly devastated. Um, but we're just trying to live each day like it's, you know, like it's the last. And she said, I'm, I'm so scared for you, you know, coming up to the Rocky Mountains. And, and there's a part of me that just doesn't want you to do it. But there's also this other side that I just think, you know what, Jamie, you, you have to keep doing what you're doing and, and helping um, people like my boys, you, you, you've got to keep going. It's a powerful, powerful message, isn't it? And let's let's touch on the way in which you raise the money as well. Do you, do you want to uh, talk through um, how you engaged every different sort of state um, in Canada along the way? Yeah, you know, I was raising money for children's hospitals in the UK, so the ones that helped me, so Great Ormond Street and the, and the local Gloucester one. Um, but to to maximise fundraising in Canada, what we've done is we 
we took on every children's hospital in every province. So that way, any Canadian that wanted to essentially support the run, they could donate back into their own community. So it would, it would be, it would relate to them. You know, it's like, it's like asking French people to donate to uh, UK children's hospitals. They're just not going to do it. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to, make a difference in that way and what i found is everywhere i went you know all the the sick kids and the families would come out and join me join me running amazing let's uh let's just touch on cake theory for a minute <laughs> this is i think one of the most brilliant and important things we discussed when we met the first time do you want to talk us through your cake theory yeah you know i will happily talk about cake <laughs> at the end of the run like i i i, I realized for three years doing the adventures i'd been chased the big happy cake you know like the cake being the big goal and so i, I imagine myself you know being in a rocking chair and being like oh you know i don't have to ever do anything now for the rest of my life i've achieved everything and i'm just going to be sitting there happy and when I finally got there, um, you know, I was just like jumping off a bridge. I thought, well, you know, where is this big happy cake? Where's the happiness? And there was just absolutely nothing there. And then I got a phone call from uh, a friend of mine called Mario Peters. And he just called me out and he was like, how are you doing, Jamie? And I was like, he's like, do you know what, Mario? I was like, I'm the saddest man on the planet. I was like, why? I thought I'd be the happiest man on the planet. I've raised a quarter of a million pounds for hospitals. It like a good story's gone out to a hundred million people, but I just feel like I've achieved nothing. And he was like, "Ah, oh, Jamie, let's go for a, a coffee." And we we ended up sitting down and having a coffee. And there was a cake in front of us, and we're just like we're just chatting away. And he's just like he's like, "Do you know what, Jamie?" He said, "I watched your journey." And he said, "He said I, I watched you chase the big goal." And he was like, "It's really important that we have our goals in our life because that keeps us striving." But he's like, "It's a little bit like this cake on the table," and he just went smash. And I was like, "Mario, you know, I was going to eat that." And he said, "Mate, it is all about the crumbs." Amazing. So to kind of clarify that, the most important point of, uh, of, of kind of what, what we're calling cake theory is that it's important to enjoy every step along the way, which is consuming the crumbs, because ultimately that is the pleasure you derive from it. It's not one great big portion of enjoyment at the end. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. It's almost, and I think, yeah, it's almost, you're right. It's almost like, uh, like you're, you're eating crumbs along the way, but then you've got like a, yeah, at the end, it's great. You've got a big slice, like a big slice, but it's definitely not a whole cake. And then obviously, once you eat the big slice, it's about forming new crumbs. And yeah. Fascinating. So um, let's talk now um, about some of the questions which are kind of standard questions which I go, go yeah. through and ask everyone. So let's, let's talk about what motivates you. What, what does motivate you? And if that's changed over time, you know, yeah. feel free to kind of share the details. Yeah, no, it, it, it has actually. I guess at the beginning, I wasn't completely fulfilled with my own life. It wasn't right for me, tennis coaching. It wasn't... It wasn't hitting the button. So um, I realized I needed to create a change within my world. I didn't quite know what that was. Um, and, and then, you know, I, with the reflection, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to, you know, help the children's hospitals if I go on this big adventure? And so I kind of, you know, paired the two. As time went on on that journey on the Bangkok to Gloucester, you know, um, adventure was a huge motivation in the fact that you just have no idea what you're going to wake up to and, and the people you're going to meet. So that's almost like motivation in itself. When it got really, really difficult, I then kind of clung on to the fact that I was hoping that I was making a difference to the hospital that helped me. So that became like a real drive through the really um, tough patches. And when I got back after the Bangkok to Gloucester, I then received one message um, from a guy who just said, Jamie, I've just been watching your YouTube videos um, and I want you to know that I'm now cycling around the world and I'm going to raise money for this charity. 
and literally told me, I thought, hang on a minute, that's a bit weird. I, I didn't intend that. Like, I, I just went to raise money for the hospital. I didn't, what, what, and it just, my brain just spiraled. What, this is like, how, and it was really tough to take. He called me an inspiration, and I actually didn't know what that word meant, so I had to Google it. Um, and it really, it really blown me away, you know, because I'd never been called anything like that before. And and then I thought, well, okay, maybe this is bigger than just fundraising. So um, I guess the the message that that I mentioned about Samuel, you know, that okay, maybe the money I raise isn't quite you know changing his life, but maybe it's just showing the mum that there is someone out there and there is someone trying. Um, and and yeah, I guess since now. Um, now I've set up the charity, I've found a whole new motivation and that's to take what I've learned and then help other fundraisers and other adventurers um, and help them with their challenges. And that's that's called the Superhero Foundation? Uh, yep. And um, so how's that going so far? Is there is there anything you want to kind of share on that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, same again, you know, that you can probably tell there's quite a lot of naivety through with the adventures. And when I set up the charity, it was kind of, you know, the same thing. But what I realized is, you know, you know when you're dead, Toby, you know, it's like, it's quite sad, isn't it? You're just dead. It's, like, all, over. it's all over. And, and I thought it would be really nice to try and set something up that helps people, even if I'm not here. Um, and so, yeah, I guess with all the superhero costumes that I've been wearing, that it was only right that it was called Superhero Foundation. And when we set up, a dad got in touch and he, he called me up and he just said, Jamie, we're trying to get our daughter out to America for an operation to enable her to walk. She's got cerebral palsy. We've raised £30,000, but we need another twenty. Can you help? And I was like, you know, I'm I'm not sure, James. I was like, how about I come to your house tomorrow and I'll, I'll just see. So I turn up at his door and I knock on it and he answers and he's got this big massive beer belly on him. And he's like, hey, mate, do you want a beer or do you want a coffee? And I was thinking, I'll just take a coffee for now. You know, it doesn't feel right just now to be drinking beer with you. Um, and I met the family and it was really, really warm. And then I, I said to the mum and the dad, who wants to be the superhero? And the mum and the dad kind of just pointed at each other. And I was like, I was like, right, well, who wants a challenge then? And that's when the dad, James, kind of just piped up and he went, do you know what? He's like, I fancy the challenge all my life. And I was like, good, James. And literally, so I worked out the day before. I don't even know where this one came from. But I worked out that if he went up and down our local hill, on Robinswood Hill, um, 75 times, that would be the equivalent of Mount Everest. Um, and when I shared that with him, you want to see his face. Like, he was just, no way. And then uh, and then his wife piped and went, come on, James, you know, pull your finger out. You can do this, you know. And he was like, right, okay, bugger it, I'll do it. Um, and the next day, he then calls me up again. And he's like, Jamie, he's like, I've just done 25 summits out of the 75. And he's like, my knee is absolutely buggered. And I was just thinking, oh, like, what were you thinking? You know, of course it's buggers. And then I, uh, but in the end, I just said, do you know what, James? It won't be your, it won't be your physicality that will get you up Everest and down. I was like, it will be your motivation for your daughter. Um, so anyway, I said, just don't do nothing now for the next month, and I'll see you at the hill. And so I see him at the hill and we, we get, he gets rocking. He starts going up and down and he goes for like 15 hours. You know, he's a really big guy and you can see he's starting to struggle. And then he gets to, he gets to 20 hours. And, uh, and after 20 hours, he just comes down and he starts pouring his eyes, like his eyes just crying his eyes out. And he's like, Jamie's like, I can't take another step. Like, I'm, I'm spent. He said, my knee is gone. He said, and I was looking at him, Toby, and I was thinking, there's another 40 more hours to go. You know, I'm not really expecting this at this time. So I told him a story because the right story at the right time can change someone's perception. So I, I, I then told him about a guy called Terry Fox. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Terry Fox ran across Canada with cancer and one leg. Um, and, and he just kind of looks up at me at the end of the story and he's like, he's like, what? Like he's ran with a stump. And I was like, with a stump, James. And he's like, all the way across Canada. And I was thinking, I better leave the part out where Terry Fox like passed away. 
So he just gets up and he just starts like hobbling on. Um, and then he went to 40 more hours. And then he literally comes down, he starts puking and he couldn't stand up. And so I'm like, oh no, this is not good. So we're like, do you know what? If he can't stomach food and he's just, he can't walk, let's, let's give him some sleep. So we gave him one and a half hours sleep. And we went up to his wife and said, what's he been requesting for for food? And she said, a McDonald's. And we're like, that hasn't been in the game plan from the day we met him. And we're like, do you know what? Let's just give him what he wants. So he wakes up, we stuff him full of McDonald's, like Big Mac, obviously. And then he like he gets up and I'm like, right, let's read out some Facebook messages to help motivate him. You know, so I, the first message that comes up, it's like, uh, come on, James, you know, every step you make, you're, you're changing your life's daughter. You have to keep going. And then BBC Radio Gloucestershire there were there, so they put the mic to his mouth, and he just starts pouring his heart down the mic, saying, "I've just got to do this for my family." And it was seven o'clock on a Monday morning, so literally everyone was driving to work. Everyone heard it. It went national in the end, and all these grannies and granddads started turning up. One granddad turned up with like ten years of coppers that he'd been saving up to donate towards Charlotte. And he, he then just started hobbling on. Um, and he went for 50 hours non-stop. And there was 10 summits left. And we're like, we still don't know if he's going to do it. Like he, he had to walk down backwards because his knees got so bad. And we put up posters then at the bottom of the marquee. And we put 10, 9, 8, 7. And it was a piece of paper. So, you know, it would be very visual for him to rip it down. So he would feel like he's really getting there. Anyway, when it gets to number four, Toby, like Summit 4, there's hundreds of people and he just looks at everyone. And bear in mind, James is this really quiet and humble guy. And he's like, come on! And then he goes over to number four and like he rips it down, he eats it. And we're like, what's going on, James? And then he literally just starts running up and down like no one could keep up with him. And then we all joined him for the final summit. And we just said, just so you know, James, you have now smashed the target. Um, like you have all the money, over £20,000 for Charlotte. She is going to America. She will be having this life-changing operation. And then we sprayed him full of champagne and we set off fireworks. And then we wheeled uh, Charlotte over in her wheelchair. And we, we gave her the number one sign. And he just gave her a big, massive hug. Um, and that was the start. That's what the Superhero Foundation does. <laughs> well, hopefully there's many more events like that to come. Um, let's talk about setting goals. Do you set goals? How do you approach them if you do? Uh, goals are really important. It's the, it's the cake theory again. Like you need, you, you need a big slice of cake and you, you know, you have, because that keeps us striving. Um, but the reality is that as long as we now know that, that there's no real cake and it really is all about the crumbs, you know, I think that's, that's the most important thing. Let's talk about some philosophical questions. So when are you happiest? Um, that's a really good question. Actually, I would love to share this with you because while I was on the run and while I was cycling, you know, and you're really striving and you're really driving forwards, I would like to say that that was my happiest. And obviously, once you stop striving, well, then I was like, well, do I have to keep running and cycling all day long to be happy? So over the space of about six months, I gradually came down and then I suddenly, um, I sat down and had a cup of coffee and I had my mum and dad in the room uh, with my foster kids and I sat there sipping away and I was so, so happy. If anything, I was just as happy as being on the run and running, you know, like all those miles. And what I realised is that that was my moment where I found contentment and I think, you know, it's great to strive, but now I essentially just love spending time with family and friends and just being silly and just not having a big goal in place, you know, and just enjoying that time as well. So do you think you're lucky? I always say I'm lucky. You know, I, I think I'm really blessed. I think I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, especially that, you know, my, my illness didn't progress. So that is, yeah, I mean, that is hugely lucky. Um, with everything that 
Um, I'm achieving. I've got one person, uh, Rich Lee, who, who who helps guide me, and he always says, "Oh, shut up, Jamie. It's got nothing to do with le- luck." He's like, "Luck just doesn't even exist. You've put the work in and and made it happen." And so I I don't know. I'm still battling between. I just think I'm pretty lucky, and and any you know a lot of hard work that goes with it. Do you think there's a big difference between? the way you react when things go badly and the way you react when things go well and as a result of doing these extreme challenges does that give you a better reference point adventure definitely helps you um it with challenges in life you know if you if you get a bad foot you know you got to battle through that bad foot suddenly if your girlfriend dumps you then you know, you, it's a little bit related. Like, oh, if I can get through that bad fog and get through this. So there are, you know, adventure can definitely help you within your life or your work life. Um, what was the question again, Toby? I feel like I'm... I feel like I'm how do you react when things go badly? Ah, and how do you react when things go well? Ah, yes. Okay, right. So we're getting right down into it now. So when things go badly, I'm not going to lie... I go a little bit ballistic. I've got like this chimp in my brain and I go, ah, and I go mental. Uh, but I realise now that I kind of try and keep that away from public or I just let it out in front of people that just know that I'm just losing my rag. Uh, and, and so I think it's important to really let it out when things go wrong, but then it's how quickly you bounce back. Yeah. And, and then the other one, I guess, when things are going well... And it's trying to realise now that to, to, to relish that and, oh, this is a juicy crumb right now and to really recognise it and, and enjoy it. Embrace the crumbs. <laughs> Loads of cake chat. Loads of it. So um, this, this is an unfair question, but um, do, is there, do you feel, is there one thing above all else that you think drives you? It's a really good question. I think there's there's multiple there's multiple motivations what we speak about. Um, I think now it's now it's the social impact, especially setting up the charity. So um, recently, I just done a a big dance of on thirty six hours with this mum Charlotte, and when I met her a year ago, she was she was four stone overweight. And she wanted to raise £80,000 to get her cerebral palsy son out to America to enable him to walk and to hopefully walk like, you know, like we do. Um, and then she just wants him to have a normal life. And the years gone on and this, this girl, when I met her, she had so little confidence. She had no idea she could raise £80,000 and she had no idea she could dance for 36 hours non-stop. And I'm really glad to say that a few weeks ago we actually achieved her dream. We raised the money. She smashed the challenge. She's four stone lighter. And it was all to change her boy's life. But what we realise is that there was so much more than that. Like now we've got this mum that has all these friends because of her journey, you know, that she's she just relished the crumbs, you know, all the way through. And and now she's, you know, just loving life and her family. Family life is just so much better, and and obviously you know Charlie. Oh, sorry, um, Archie ends up getting his operation, and he is walking. You know, he's walking like a normal human being. But there's, it's so much more than that. It's incredible. So, last few questions: What would you say to your eighteen-year-old self? Stop drinking booze. Just stop. Like, why are you doing that? Why are you just? Like, why are you messing about? Or like, stop it. And the thing is, though, Toby, it's a really good question because I, I always go through life and I, ne- I there's never any regret. So anything that you yeah. do in life, I never go, oh, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done it that way. You know, I still now I look back and I go, yeah, I drank like an idiot and I was such a, like a knob. I was just a knob head. But but I learn a lot from from those years. I, you know, it was a really big years of being sociable and making lots of mistakes. And so now I have that as life experience to hopefully not make those mistakes. Yeah. So in in a way, those mistakes are golden. That's exactly how we learn. 
Was having a tough time as a child actually a huge blessing in disguise for you? I, it's a really good question. You're right. Is it just a mindset that you that you can anything that you're tackled with in life? You just you, it's just a, a matter of mindset. And yeah, I guess it's you like. I guess like boiling up your life story of what motivates you and and yeah I often I see so yeah I was really sick and there were sometimes where I couldn't move my legs and then suddenly now I'm running across Canada and I'm so it does that play a role you know the fact that I was sick I would probably say yes and my my dad would say you know what son you know like you're sick as a kid you gotta keep moving you know you and so yeah I think it's it's our life story isn't it you know like that, that makes us so unique and special and that's what that's what propels us so yeah I, I i think it is a matter of mindset i think that's a perfect place to end it thanks for sharing your inspiring story jamie cheers to, i love what you're doing as well the book is going to be awesome make sure you buy it but very importantly buy it and follow the superhero foundation <laughs> Oh, no, 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 I love you more. <laughs> <laughs>